Good evening, folks. This is Tony from Campfire and Countryside. Um, I'm making uh, this video today because I want to introduce somebody to y'all. And I know that if you've watched um, any of my videos in the past, you saw the video with the archery range. In the, the first video that I made, the introductory video, I told you that I've just about worked myself to death this summer. Well, I worked myself to death building an archery range, and we built it over on the farm. And opening day, we had an individual that come up. He's a lifelong, or not a lifelong friend, but a longtime friend of our family. And his name is Mr. Donald Dobbs. Mr. Dobbs is a longbow shooter and a recurve shooter. He shot longbows and recurves his whole life, and his kids, are they do the same. One thing about Mr. Dobbs is he has a good friend named Mr. Howard Hill. And Howard Hill is famous around the state of Alabama and the country for shooting longbows and trick shooting and things like that. So Mr. Dobbs and Mr. Hill, they've opened up some ranges around the country and really just, they were good friends forever and ever until Mr. Hill passed away. Well now Mr. Dobbs is up in his mid eighties. He's one of the most interesting people that I have ever sat down and just had a conversation with. And my wife and I were talking and I told her, I said, you know, before Mr. Dobbs really um, gets up too far in age, we really need to take a little bit of time and interview him and introduce him to the world and let folks know who he is. And so my wife took a an opportunity this week and sit down with Mr. Dawes for a couple hours with him and one of his sons, Randy, and they had a long conversation about things they've done in the past and things he's done in his life as far as archery is concerned, and that's something that I want to share with y'all. He is a super interesting guy. So, we're going to turn this over to my wife and let my wife interview Mr. Dobbs. So we are here today with Mr. Donald Dobbs and his son, Randy Dobbs. They are the longbow champions here. Uh -huh. And they are getting their bows out and getting them strung up and getting them ready to fire off and sling a few arrows through the air today. But we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to sit and talk to them about um, their history of archery. So Randy, a few quick questions for you. Okay. Um, when did you start shooting a longbow? How old were you and how did you get started? I, I actually shot a recurve when I got started. Uh, we saw, we did shoot like some little small fiberglass longbows, but uh, I had an American made recurve at about 30 pounds and my brother had one that was 32 pounds. and. Uh, they shot really good, and that was that was somewhere around nine years old as far as you know shooting and shooting in some of the tournaments and the competition. Uh, I always played baseball, and uh, most of the time I'd still have my baseball uniform on when I would go to the archery range. And uh, there was a young man; he would usually out shoot me a few points. They always said that I was wore out when I got there, but. Uh, always enjoyed just you know the out of doors i've been outside most of my life but uh you know the the simplicity of traditional archer archery uh I, I love all the archery and anything that you shoot i'm proud for people you know to be able to to go out and enjoy what god has made for us but uh that's what it is and and being with my dad i've always enjoyed going and and hunting with dad. Sometimes we don't bring anything home, but we bring stories home. So that's always been good. I guess that's why they call it hunting and not killing. Some. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, there's a lot more population deer wise now than uh, it has been, but uh, I've, I've hunted before uh, in some national forests, some places that are really hard hunting and, and not see many deer, but I have also killed some deer in national forests. So usually when you kill something, uh, like that in national forest land where you're not accessible, you know, like maybe with four wheelers and different things like that. Uh, 
you've really done and hunted hard, but uh, it, it makes you feel good when, you know, sometimes when you get to bring something home too. Now, would you say that your dad was a, a big influence on you in oh, the sport def- of archery? Definitely, uh, you know, because we've, we've always been close, but uh, we we used to do different things at, at different times. So we would, uh, we'd go bow fishing in the spring and uh, that was that was always a great time you know for us uh the the older people that were there the mature people uh they'd have the reels and different things on theirs we had bare arrows you know when we would do our bow fishing so me and my brother would usually have to shoot and then run ours down you know like that but uh sometimes you know we'd make a good enough shot where we'd stick it to the you know the the ground there so it was it was good enough that we could just go and retrieve uh remember one time in equality we were shooting red horse suckers and dad and one of his friends were going up the creek and we were there with uh, our mom and uh, we was we had found a pretty good hole of the fish and every time you know they'd come up from surface uh dad and his friend came back and they had like a plastic trash can full of fish but we had a plastic trash can full of fish too when we stayed in that one spot so <laughs> we were pretty good we bragged a little bit about that this is mr donald dobbs he is uh, randy's dad that got randy started into archery um, he is also known as the stick and string man but i was looking at an older archery magazine article earlier and i saw where you were also called Dead Eye Donald, do you remember that, or Dead Eye Dobbs? I've been called a lot of things. <laughs> not <laughs> how necessarily, did you, how did not you get necessarily that name? so. I don't know. Not not real sure. It's just it was, I was really, really aiming hard. I guess that's what they were talking about. Oh, absolutely. My, my friend from Tennessee, he and his two boys came down from Tennessee, and Tom Martin was in a wheelchair. I think Tom Martin was the one that named me that and but he made the whole archery range that me and Mr. Hill organized back in 1967. We had to build two archery ranges in Fenton, Alabama. Uh, the first one was a beautiful range but the people sold the land out from under us and so Mr. Hill found us another place and so we built it too. Now Mr. Hill, he is from Wilsonville, is that correct? Or is he Mr. From, Hill, actually from Howard Wilson? Hill? Yes. The most famous archer in the world was born in Wilsonville, Alabama, moved to Vincent in 1966, or, or started building his home in 66. We organized the Archer Club uh, Creek Bow Hunters in 1967, and uh, it was under the Lions Club, but of course they didn't do anything, it was just under their uh, name. But, but, we did all the work, and Mr. Hill laid the range out, and, and us younger fellas built it. Now, I understand that you had some bows that was made by Howard Hill. Is that correct? Well, I, I don't own it. I had a lot of memorabilia, some arrows and some different things that belonged to Mr. Hill, and I do have some Howard Hill broadheads, uh, some of the old ones, original ones. But uh, my home burned in 1985, December of 85, and all my Howard Hill memorabilia and boxes full of pictures and hunts that we've been on and different things. I've got some things in, that you have in your uh, collection that places where we went and hunted together. Now I had some copies made of some photos of Howard. Um, I do have one of the last time that he drawed his bow back and I have some of Mr. Hill sitting in a chair, and I believe that your sons, Randy and Steve, were yeah. standing behind him. Yes, yes. So he had a big part in your life, wouldn't you say? Oh yeah, they, <laughs> they call, Mr. Hill called Randy the Indian, and called my other son the, the Englishman. The Englishman. Uh, <laughs> uh, he was more fair skinned like myself, and Randy was a little bit darker skinned. You can't tell with them white whiskers. Well, um, I also have seen some pictures, and I think I've got a, a little clip of some home video that I might add here and show. But um, it's um, uh, about a boar hog that Mr. Hill killed. Now, I did see you skinning one of his hogs. Well, that was, no, that was 
an, another person that we hunted with that wasn't one of his, but we did compare them on that film. Okay, okay. The one that Mr. Hill had was a large head with a large tusk, and this other one that you saw me skinning, then we uh, showed it on the old home movie film, uh, what it looked like after it was uh, bleached out and compared to Mr. Hill's head. But uh, it was nevertheless, it was a wild hog that it was killed over in Georgia. The one that Mr. Kill, Hill killed was, uh, best I can remember, is off the, on Catalina Island off the coast of California. Now, uh, what is the story behind this one hog that he killed with an arrow that was chasing him? <laughs> this is a story he told, and uh, he, he could flower it up if he wanted to, but Mr. Hill, being a Christian man, he, he didn't deliberately lie. He might have painted it a, a pretty color sometime. But he shot the hog, and it went through that old jaw, and the, you know, on, on wild hog, a true wild hog, the Russian type four, it's, it's, it's like a, a complete shield, that shoulder. And when it went through that, it hit that shoulder and it, it didn't kill the hog. Well, it come out of the palmetto bushes and he, he used a back quiver like, like this. And he, uh, he wasn't able to retrieve another arrow in time, it was right on him. And he said it got so close to him that it, it cut his belt loop with its tusk. And he says, you can better believe that I gained on that hog then. And of course, he, he said he turned around and shot that hog and shot him right in the brain and he dropped it right there. But uh, that picture that we showed, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was that particular one. Then we also have that picture uh, that you have and putting it, he had it on a uh, strap to his back and that was probably the one, but I'm not positive. Yeah, I do have Because he did kill, he did kill a lot of wild hogs. <laughs> this is a funny story. The one that we hunted in Valdosta, Georgia, everything looked the same. The pines, like these, they had these old pines and they, they tapped them for the turpentine and the rosin, and, and they put those little tin cans in, and they would drip in it. Everything looked the same. It was all flat, nothing but pines and palmetto bushes, and there was little uh, uh, drain ditches, and everything looked exactly the same. You could get lost in, in two minutes if you got turned around. But I saw, I mean, tracks. They was all leading right down this drainage ditch. I mean, just thousands of, of tracks. I said, good gracious, where in the world? I'm going where these hogs are going. And I went on down, oh, I walked down maybe 100 yards down that drainage ditch and looked up, and Mr. Hill was in st a little stand. It was about, oh, higher than I could reach, just enough to get out of the reach of a wild hog. And they had put him up in that stand. I said, uh, I looked up at him, I said, Mr. Hill, have you seen any hogs? He said, no, but I've seen a zillion bow hunters. <laughs> everybody, everybody that ever run across that little drainage ditch and saw them hog tracks, naturally, they're going to follow them tracks and see where them hogs are going. They went, they went right past, and that's the reason they put Mr. Hill on that, because wherever the hogs was going, they was going on that drainage ditch, and they put him on it, but... All he saw was bow hunters. And y'all did a lot of hunts over in Uvalda? We did. We we hunted uh, s several times. There's a little place called, it's it's pretty near Vidalia, Georgia, yeah. that mm -hmm. made the Vidalia onion famous. It's right on the Altima Hall River. And uh, we... Uh, and y'all were hunting with your uh, traditional archery. Longbows, yeah. like it, yeah, yeah. In fact, you've got a picture in there of Mr. Hill back in 1971. That was one year that we hunted there. Sure did. Tell, yeah. tell about the Russian boars that they had turned loose in Valdosta. Well, Where they, they uh, these were all native wild boars. It was just hogs that had gone wild over many, many, many years. But they bought one of these Russian boars that 
at some of these preserves they had up in Pennsylvania. They would uh, uh, raise them and turn them loose and you know stuff like that. But they bought one of these Russian boars to breed back to these native uh, sows that they would catch in traps. And then whenever they would catch a native a little native boar, they'd cut him where he wouldn't re. He just they wanted all those Russian type boars, and so he was well. He was, well, he was about almost twice as long as one of these tables. I'm serious. His, his head and tusk and snout, it, it was two feet long. It had to be. I, I wish I had a picture. I don't know if I've got it in any of my stuff or not, but he was huge. Did they have the armored shields in there? Oh, yeah, armored see, it, it's just a natural thing. It builds up in them because they fight. Uh, in breeding season, it's just like any other animal, deer, elk, everything. They fight. Well, that protected them. It, it was built up in them. It just made a, a, a gristle, like a gristle, and and they and you couldn't hardly you couldn't shoot through it hardly. Uh, but it it was real tough. And but they they put that he was they put this thing in a pen, and and you could walk up to the pen close, and he would just about tear it. He he actually I guess being so stressed, he finally just. I think he died from just stress, or I don't know what happened to him. But, but so they, those things are big and mean. Yeah, huh? but they, there's a lot of them little, his little boys and girls that's running around out there in Uvalda, Georgia. Oh, to this day, yeah. I bet there's some offspring. Yeah, yeah. Now, do they still have hunts over in Uvalda? Well, they don't. They, these couple of son, uh, brothers, they would let us use a bunkhouse. I mean, it was a, it was a bunkhouse. Uh, it was. Oh, it was twice as big as your, your two buildings put together made out of concrete blocks. Oh, and they charged us $5 a night to bunk up and hunt every day. $5 a night. And that's just, I, but, you know, people come from everywhere. And uh, that's where the, the boy that I was skinning the hog for. And the reason we skin them, Mr. Hill told us this. Now, you don't want to try to scrape them things because they're full of ticks and fleas. The best way to do it is to just uh, hang them up and kind of strip them and then and take something, pliers, and then just, just peel the hide off them or, or just like I was doing with a knife, just like you're skinning a deer and just, just get the hide plumb off them because they're just loaded with ticks and fleas. Now, how did you get the name Stick and String Man? Well, that's all I use is Stick and String. <laughs> By the way, this is Randy's... I had uh, uh, Bobby Lofton over in Mississippi build this bow for Lanise, his mother, and uh, so I, I, I'm going to shoot her bow, All right. and I'm going to kill a deer uh, with this bow for her and for Randy and my other son, Steve, and, uh, in honor of her, and uh, I'm 86 years old, and it may be my last year. I'm going to have to make it count. And you're going to sit in my stand. And I'm going to get in... Miss Catherine Green's tree stand. That's right, and we're gonna we're gonna let you kill a deer, and then we're gonna and, and, and skin another it and we're gonna eat it. Another name that people used to give me is Mister Stob. Mister Stob. Because I go out and I'm gonna stob me a deer. Gonna stob you a deer. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go watch y'all shoot a little bit. This quiver here, a, a friend of mine made these. It, is, it's a, it protects your arrow at all times. Jerry Simmons made all kinds, all kinds of little novelty things for bow hunters. And uh, he made this, and they'll, they'll protect your arrow. This way I like to shoot deer close. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to put this in the hooker book. I can't shoot that in this broad head. Side of this shoulder. Zim shoot pretty good in it. Let's try and get up. Yeah, they too still for that. I, I killed a young six point. One time out of a ladder stand. I was hunting out of one of my friend's stands with this benchmark bow. And uh, it came in and it was so close I couldn't stand up, so I was still in a seated position. And 
there was one opening where if it presented itself, you know, I was going to try a shot. There was a pretty nice doe that come in just right in front of the six point and she turned away. She didn't come to the clear spot, but he come just enough in that clear spot and uh, I was able to make a good draw still seated and I shot the six point whirl. I was, I was shooting for right behind the front shoulder and he made a whirl. I don't know where he heard the noise or what, but it hit just a little bit further back in the femoral artery and he hit the ground. He didn't last very long, so I didn't have to do any tracking or anything. And uh, I, I've got mitral valve prolapse, but that little pill didn't help me a whole lot. I got pretty excited <laughs> and uh, had a little bit of a spell there. But uh, as I got down out of the ladder stand, I had knocked another arrow and there was one that come just head on. You couldn't see the feet touching the ground. And it was, you know, it was getting just a little dim because it was an evening hunt. And uh, I drawed down on it, but then I pulled back down. I said, there's no use in me shooting at this deer. I've already got one down right here. So, you know, sometimes we get greedy, but I enjoyed that. Oh, I, I was, bet you did. I was with my dad hunting and he had made some shots that evening also. You got a good shot on it. Whoa. Thing. You might want to stop right there. <laughs> further back than I want. But, but you know what? That'd take him down in a little yeah, bit, wouldn't it? I think so. Let's go see where Papa hit. Yeah, let's he go hit. down here he and look. Good. Look at that. Mm -hmm. He double lunged him. right in the bullseye. Oh, that'll kill him. Hanging like grapes. Hanging really? like grapes. That's, 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 that's good too, enough. Too far close, but... It has still brought him down. Yeah. When he gets through, I'll tell you about it shot that I made on one, oh, kind of like that. And you get to think about, there's always a most unique ways that you've hit a deer and was able to, <laughs> to take it home with you. And there's a lot of them that I hit perfect and couldn't find them because it started raining, you know, wash out my blood trail. But this one particular deer, it was in real dry season. And uh, I hunted in a hunting club coming from through Sulacock and headed toward Ellick City and crossing Hatchet Creek. You turn off to the right there and I was hunting in a club back in there. <clears throat> well, this particular year, there was only one fella that was hunting with me and I was gonna be the camp cook. We had an old home with uh, bunking in and It'd take a cord of wood a day to keep it warm. And uh, the kitchen would freeze and, and the, where we slept would stay warm. But uh, I'd get some little cones on some bushes that the deer likes and, and I kept seeing this four point and I couldn't, couldn't get on him. So I, I got in a place, I said, maybe he'll come through here and I put some of those little black cones. It tastes like you can make lemonade out of it. I can't think of what you call it. Make lemonade out of it. And I was, I got in a big pine tree. I was shooting, I, I believe I was shooting left-handed then. Yeah, anyway, I was in that pine tree and I had him pictured to come in this way, which would have been good. I've been, been good. Well, he come from this way and he come which would have been a bad angle to shoot, according to what people tells you. <laughs> there ain't no bad angle if you can hit them right. Well, when he come in toward me, I said, well, I can't, he's just not right. But he was standing like this, facing me, 
and he turned his head this way. But when he turned his head that way, that opened up, that opened up that whole front chest. And I said, if I can get right through, uh, let's see, he'd be, he, he was standing, looking at me like this, and he's turning, if I figured if I could get right through here, I could get right into vitals. Well, I had parked my truck, my four-wheeler, uh, eighth of a mile on the little old road. I was a uh, hundred yards from my tree stand, uh, but the, the four-wheeler was up about, about eighth of a mile up the road. Well, when I shot that deer, it made a perfect shot where I wanted to hit the only way I could have hit it. Well, he took off in the world and he went up there and laid down right beside my four-wheeler. <laughs> but didn't y'all, um, you also shoot a uh, deer one time that it's um, antler stuck in a pine oh, tree? Oh, yeah, that was up in the Chocolaca management area. I set up right on the big lake. I can't remember what the name of that lake was, but it's a huge lake up in the Chocolaca management area. All the Georgia bow hunters would come over there. That was before Alabama was allowed to legally use tree stands. But the Georgia boys brought their Georgia tree stands over there and they would kill the deer. But anyway, I got on this and I found good, good deer sign on white oaks. Well, I went ahead and got up the tree and I was kind of facing the big lake and the deer's coming off to my, to my left. I think I was shooting right-handed then. <laughs> Can you imagine shooting left-handed, right-handed? And it came and he got on out and I shot, made a good hit on him, made a good hit on him. Well, it was almost right straight down uh, to the, to the, right of that big lake and he was kind of running down that way and there was a huge a huge white oak tree he hit that tree with his right antler and broke it off in that tree i did not know it was in there i was i got it got the deer and I drug it up to my Volkswagen bus and loaded it up and took it to to where we was hanging them. We was hanging them illegally. We was hanging them in the outdoor <laughs> toilets. <laughs> <laughs> and Clarence Yates got caught and had to pay a fine for his. But I hung it there and then took it to the place the next morning. And he said that deer had done reverted back, said it was an old deer. It, it was probably uh, six, maybe seven, eight years old and reverted back to a long spikes. It was long spikes. I, I kept it for years and years till my home burned in 85. Anyway, I says, I'm gonna go back and see if I can find that antler and, and you know, glue them together. I wanna keep it just for a souvenir. And cause I just been to, I had just been to Colorado and killed elk. I said, man, I'm on a roll. I'm on a roll here. I'm. A, I believe I shot it left-handed. I'm pretty sure I shot it left-handed because, yeah, shot it left-handed. So anyway, I said, I'm on, a, I'm on a roll. And I said, I'm gonna get that antler and I'm gonna piece it together and have a story about it. And I went and I looked and followed right down where it went and, and got to just looking. And that arrow, that antler where he flipped was sticking and broke off into that tree, broke off and was still sticking in the tree. There's just so many out in God's country that you run across things that's just so unusual, unusual. And that's the reason I'm so thrilled. I've put off these last few years, they gave me that hormone treatment and, and I don't have any strength, but the Lord's given me enough strength that I can shoot my, my wife's Randy's mother which has passed away in 09 I'm shooting her bow and if the Lord will just if he'll just let me get out there and hunt that'll be fine enough but if I kill a deer that'd be more than fine we're gonna see if we can't get you uh, on one but uh after a while just being out there in the hunt is better than just killing because you, then you got to skin it and all that kind oh, of stuff oh yeah but, then comes the work oh me but it's it's fun it's so much fun I've had so much the Lord's blessed me so many years 
to be able to do this. It's been, I, see, I, I didn't meet Mr. Hill till after I started hunting in Chocolaca. And I started hunting in Chocolaca in, in the early, about 1961. And it was 62 before I actually ever met Mr. Hill. Then I got to, got to meet him again at the, at the sports show, hunting show. But anyway, it's been a, it's been a good ride. It's been a good ride.